Most of us in this room probably use cryptography first thing in the morning. If you're like me, you got out of bed and picked up your phone and maybe browsed some websites or checked your email. Each of these tasks is protected by cryptographic technology that was really honed over decades of experience. I think what we've seen is only in the beginning. I think that in the near future, we're gonna see cryptographic technology that not only protects your data as it's in transit over the network or as it's stored on disk, but while it's in use and being computed on, on itself. My name's Steve Weiss, and I'm a software engineer with the Facebook privacy, data privacy team. I've spent my whole career applying cryptography to protect people's sensitive data. I'm excited to be here today to talk about emerging cryptography and the models of private computation that'll help enable. I think to th see where we're going, we need to see where we've been and also who is left behind. We need to learn the lessons of the past and make sure that the technology that we build doesn't just benefit the people in this room, but the next billion people who come online. There's a large and growing body of people whose experience coming online is very different than mine was, and most likely different than yours. There are people who have never used a keyboard before. They may share a device with multiple people and pay for internet connectivity as they go. They also may not be legally allowed to use the same technologies and services that we, we can. I think as we talk about emerging cryptography today, I wanna to keep all the people emerging online in mind. Now looking back at the past, one of the most important developments has been the widespread adoption of transport encryption, meaning the encryption of your communication over the network. It wasn't long ago that most major websites didn't default to using TLS, the Transport Layer Security Protocol, and that the traffic would be plain text over the internet. It wasn't until 2010 that Gmail first started defaulting to using TLS. Before that, unless you explicitly opted in, when you're reading your email on Gmail, your contents may have been visible to somebody who was on the network in between you. Facebook and Yahoo followed suit several years later and started enabling TLS by default. And we've since seen the emergence of things like certificate transparency, Let's Encrypt, and commercial offerings like Cloudflare's Universal SSL that all make it easier and safer to deploy TLS to your websites. The end result is that billions of people now enjoy private communications and are protected against those adversaries on the network. Now there were several major vulnerabilities and fixes in TLS that in general improved the security of the protocol for all of us. These had branded names like Poodle, Beast, or Crime. In each of these cases, the fixes may have had unintended consequences. So if you're a large site, you had a hard decision to make. Do you stop supporting a broken version of TLS and potentially cut off users with old devices that can't support the most recent version? Or do you keep supporting a weak version and potentially put everyone at risk? There's not an easy answer. And I bring this point up to illustrate that sometimes the most secure option is not always the best one, and that we need to keep usability and adoption in mind, and also realize that most people are on old, unpatched devices, and not everyone has a $1,000 iPhone. Disk encryption is another technology that's come a very long way. It wasn't long ago that encrypting your hard drive was opt-in and very fiddly and hard to get right. Over a little more than a decade, we've seen disk encryption go from something that was more or less rare to where it's the default setting on our most common devices, meaning our mobile phones. It's gotten to the point where even an agency like the FBI has to go to great lengths to decrypt an out-of-date iPhone. So the technology's here and it works. End-to-end -end encrypted messages are another technology that's really matured in recent years. Now we've had end-to-end -end encrypted messaging clients for a long time. Even America Online had a enterprise encrypted edition in 2003, and there's been many open source projects out there. But I think it wasn't until we saw the widespread adoption of smartphones that a large number of people started using what I consider to be high quality messaging apps. In 2010, Whisper Systems released Tech Secure and Red Phone, which eventually merged into Signal around 2014. That Signal protocol has been adopted by WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and most recently by Skype, and is generally considered safe and secure. I think the adoption by WhatsApp is perhaps the most impactful. There's over a billion people who are using end-to-end -end encrypted messaging today, and that rollout was largely invisible. 
Most people didn't even know it was happening. WhatsApp, from a design perspective, had some hard pragmatic security decisions to make. For people on unpatched old clients, they opted to continue to let them to use WhatsApp, meaning those conversations were temporarily visible to WhatsApp, because it wasn't end-to-end -end encrypted, until those users updated. It turns out their user base also switches devices very often. And in the underlying signal protocol, that means a new key is generated. And the right thing to do from a security perspective is to prompt users who are talking to somebody to verify those new keys, usually through an out-of-band communication channel. Well, for these users, this experience would have been very disruptive and also confusing. And also, many of these people did not have another outside communication band to verify these keys. So WhatsApp opted to not force people to manually verify and made it opt-in only. I think this is a pragmatic decision and one that kind of illustrates the trade-offs that we sometimes need to make for a security model in order to drive usability and adoption. I think this type of trade-off will be most relevant in a few slides when I start talking about technologies like secure enclaves. So what we've seen is just the beginning. In the last few years, we've seen the emergence of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, of darknet marketplaces on Tor onion nodes, and of kleptography or ransomware like NotPetya. These are all ideas that have been talked about and had false starts going back to the 80s. But in recent years, I think we started to see them impact everyday regular users' lives. So I think we live in interesting times. And things are just going to get more interesting and weird in the next few years. So private computation and private storage, in my mind, are things we know how to solve. We've seen this widespread adoption where billions of people are using it. Excuse me, private communication. I think the gap is computation. So if you're on a weak or cheap device and connecting to a cloud service, even though that connection may be encrypted, while your data is being used by that service, it's visible to them. Emerging cryptography can give us technology that can make these computations private and make our current cloud models safer and better at protecting your data. I'm going to talk about some of those technologies that are available now, in the near term, and in the long run. So software guard extensions is a technology from Intel. And the core idea is that you have a small trusted enclave in the CPU where you, as a remote user, can load software into. You'll be able to remotely attest that your authentic code is loaded in this enclave through the use of a cryptographic protocol. The end result is that you have a small trusted foothold in an otherwise untrusted system because that surrounding operating system that's running on there is not supposed to be able to access that enclave. So today, a technology like SGX gives us private computation. You can do things like provision cryptographic secrets to it or process chunks of private data. This is available now. So Microsoft's announced availability of SGX on their Azure cloud computing platform. There's multiple blockchain companies who are building their technologies rooted in SGX. And Signal, which I talked about, is doing experiments with contact sync discovery in enclaves. That means that you can find all your friends using the app without their discovery service learning who those friends are. Now, there's still kinks to work out. Namely, the security model highly trusts Intel in the attestation process. And right now, on the heels of Meltdown and Spectre, I think our confidence in CPU manufacturers' security is probably at an all-time low. Regardless, I think that this represents the most likely way to achieve private computation today, because it's available now and people are already using it. Now, along the theme of private computation and transactions, I want to talk about what's called a zero-knowledge snark. And SNARK stands for Succinct Non-Interactive Argument of Knowledge. In cryptography, the concept of a zero-knowledge proof goes back to the 80s with some researchers named Goldwasser, McCallie, and Rakoff. And the core idea is that if I possess a secret, I can prove to you that I know the secret without you learning anything about it or be able to prove to somebody else. One application of this is anonymous payments. So if Alice wants to pay Bob $100 anonymously, she can anonymize a transaction. And through the use of what's called zero-knowledge proofs of knowledge, can prove that, one, she has the money and is not creating it out of thin air, and two, is authorized to spend it. 
The interesting thing about snarks is that succinctness property. That means the proofs are short and relatively fast to verify. So this verifier can verify a large number of transactions fairly quickly. This makes this technology very suitable for cryptocurrencies. And in fact, one currency called Zcash has pioneered the use of this technology. And today is doing tens of millions of daily uh, anonymous transactions using their cryptocurrency. Since then, a larger uh, cryptocurrency called Ethereum has also announced that they will be adopting zero-knowledge snarks. And some of the authors have published a new paper as of last week with a uh, next generation, which they call a Stark, which um, will continue to build on this idea. Now, while snarks have proven themselves for transactions, a more general purpose concept I'm going to talk about is called multi-party computation. This was invented about 35 years ago by a researcher named Yao, and it's been the subject of decades of research and improvements. As a classic example, suppose Alice and Bob each have a private salary, and they want to determine who makes more money. To do so, multi-party computation allows them to do something called garbling, and they'll garble a circuit that is basically just a comparison operator. And they'll do this by engaging in an interactive protocol. And at the end of the protocol, the output to Bob will be a single bit of information, whether A is greater than B. Now, one thing to note is that this version of multi-party computation is interactive, and it's one shot. So if they want to compute some different salaries, they have to run through this whole thing again. The reason I bring this up, which is a pretty old concept in technology, is that between about 2008 and 2013, there were many security and performance improvements to multi-party computation that are making it practical for more real-world problems. And in fact, several startups are now working on applying multi-party computation to solve real problems. And the next talk is going to talk about one real-world problem that's solved by multi-party computation. Google's also been talking about using multi-party computation to share data with advertisers. But from what I can tell from public documents, they're using a construction called homomorphic encryption. In cryptography, a homomorphism is an operation that you can perform on ciphertexts that will yield the output of that encryption on the plaintexts. So if I have an encryption of A and an encryption of B, I can homomorphically add those together to get an encryption of A plus B. Meanwhile, I don't learn anything about the input value A, the input value B, or the sum. I can do the same thing with multiplication. So in this example, we could have, um, excuse me, these two operations are interesting because the combination of them allows us to build circuits. So if we can do both addition and operation, uh, addition and multiplication, we can combine these together and essentially build an encrypted circuit. So in this example, somebody could send a encrypted search query to a private service and then get back the search results, which are the output of this encrypted circuit. Now we've had homomorphic encryption for 40 years. But for most of that time, it was what was called partially homomorphic. That meant you could only do one of these operations and not the other. This meant that you could only do limited sets of private computation. It wasn't until 2009 that a researcher named Craig Gentry invented the first fully homomorphic crypto system. Now, this first system was very inefficient. It was something like a trillion times slower than the underlying circuit. But within just a few short years, that performance was sped up by a factor of 1,000. And it spurred other developments and practical things like a homomorphic encryption library called HELib. Now, one thing to note that's different between this and multi-party computation is that it's not one shot. This private computation service can serve multiple queries based on the input by doing different combinations of these ciphertexts. I don't really expect to see fully homomorphic encryption used in widespread for you know, at least five to 10 years. But I would expect to see some niche cases uh, in practice in the near future. And that eventually, a cloud service will be able to offer something like an encrypted database that lets you search over it by using homomorphic properties. <coughs> One thing you may have noticed with homomorphic encryption is that it required a round trip to do anything useful. I had to get the ciphertext back and decrypt it to do anything useful with it. Functional encryption is a notion that we can delegate some specific functionality to somebody and allow them to compute it on ciphertexts. So in this example, 
I might have a mail server that I give the ability to compute an is it spam function. And if I give them encrypted messages, they can run this on the ciphertext and determine whether they're spam, but not learn anything else. So it's reminiscent to multi-party computation and homomorphic encryption, but if you notice, there's no round trip here. The server can actually act on this information, and we know that it's limited to just learning what we decided to disclose to it. So this concept was first talked about in some identity-based crypto papers around 2005, and between about 2011 and 2013 was more formalized. At that point, some constructions were proposed based on a primitive called a multilinear map. This is still very inefficient and in its early days, but again, this is advancing very rapidly and is new. This brings me to the last concept I'm gonna talk about, which is called indistinguishability obfuscation, or just software obfuscation. The core idea is that I can take a program and obfuscate it in a way that if I give you to run it, you don't learn anything about what it's actually doing, what the algorithm is or secret values in that program. All you're able to do is feed an input and then see the output. So this is not the ad hoc obfuscation that you'd see in something like copy protection or anti-reverse engineering. In some ways, this is the cryptographic holy grail. If I have indistinguishability obfuscation, I can build everything I talked about today. So as an example, suppose I obfuscate AES encryption with a fixed key. If I give that to somebody, they can take this obfuscated AES and they're not able to learn anything about that key itself. They can just feed in inputs and get ciphertext out. So this essentially gives me the definition of public key crypto. So again, this is still very in its early phase. It wasn't until 2013 that researchers proved that this was even possible to build. But I think it's a hint at what's possible through the use of cryptography. We know it's possible to obfuscate a program and outsource that computation to somebody such that they don't even know the algorithm they're computing. So how can we all benefit from this? I've talked about cryptography that we can buy off the shelf today so it's probably decades away from being used in practice. What they all, all have in common is that they strengthen the security and privacy of outsourced computation. I think that model is gonna be important in the future because it can invisibly protect people using those relatively weak devices. If all you have is a, some local computation, network connectivity, and, and some credentials, you'll be able to access these powerful back-end private services. And I think that one day we'll be able to use cloud services without sacrificing our privacy, like we all have to today. So suppose we had this technology right now. Every couple of years I go back and, and make the same slide by just grabbing a couple months of headlines about law enforcement and government people saying that they want to regulate cryptography. I think we see a constant tension between government and law enforcement and emerging crypto. Private computation represents another channel going dark for law enforcement. Namely, that they won't be able to subpoena services for data that they no longer hold. I think if this model becomes common, what we'd see is more targeting of those endpoint devices. So all those weak, unpatched phones I was talking about, those are really soft targets. So even if we are able to build all this and deploy it, we still have to solve all the basic security problems of just securing your device, making sure it's updated, and authenticating people. We may also see legislation that requires services to retain access to their plain text data. So I think it's gonna be up to people like us in this room to continue to defend our own rights to use emerging cryptography and to protect the privacy of our own data. So I'd like to thank you all very much for listening and to the Enigma Program Committee for accepting this talk. I'm very excited about some of these technologies and truly want to see them become a reality and used in practice. So thank you all very much and uh, I think we have some time for some questions. <laughs>